Good morning, Cornerstone. It's awesome to be with you again on a Sunday morning. I hope you are doing well and that you are having a great weekend. Um, we've had such an amazing time for prayer and fasting this week. Um, we've spent some time to pray, we met online with a whole bunch of people, and we had a few meetings uh, live with everyone. Um, God has spoken to us in an incredible way. We got challenged. We felt the incredible intimacy with Jesus uh, as we did that. So um, we are going to be uh, giving out a, a document online and um, it will include all of the things that God had spoken to us as a church and what we can apply for the way forward in the season that we are in. I want to remind you that we're going to be uh, starting DNA. If you are new to Cornerstone and you want to find out more about us, this coming Wednesday at half past seven, all the information will come up on the screen. Um, so I want to encourage you to pause and to take these information down, contact us and be part of it um, if this is where you're at now. And some family news. Um, uh, family at uh, our site in the south, Avril and Sagi, Naidu. Uh, their uncle Raymond has passed away, so we express our condolences to you and your family. We, you are in our prayers, and um, may God give you peace in the time that you are in. We're going to spend some time to worship now, but I want to ask you to do something a little bit different. If you are here in a meeting in one of our venues, or if you're at home, or if you're listening to this um, in an audio uh, format, I want to ask you for the coming few moments, will you close your eyes? I want you... Um, maybe raise your hands with me and as you do that I want to ask you try to lift your hands a little bit higher try to go even more higher than you than you are right now if you can even go on your tippy toes and go even higher than that and as you do that I want to encourage you Go in God's presence in that way. I feel in my heart as we do this physically, keep this picture in your heart, in your mind, as you worship Jesus, as you listen to the word, as you even ask God, what is, what is it for me this morning that you're saying? God, I'm coming with expectations even higher than, you, than I came in this building this morning. I can do it physically and I submit my heart to you this morning to go deeper in my relationship with you, to be doing whatever you're saying to me this morning. So Lord, we do love you, we honor you, we give you praise this morning, King. We are so grateful that we can call ourselves your children. So will you accept our worship this morning, King? We love you and we want to honor you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, my 
to see the glory of your never-ending majesty we join our song in praises all the angels sing Jesus seated high above it all and all our other loves Pale before the risen sun of righteousness We're standing in the presence of your holiness Jesus seated high above it all There is just one There is only one day glorified. There is only Jesus lifted high. skies above and on the earth below as every voice proclaims what we already know Jesus seated high above it all there is just one
Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling you Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was brought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was brought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ And oh, what a Savior Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah Christ is risen Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't He one? is risen bow down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Sing with me, oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name 
Father, we will praise your name every day and forevermore, King. We worship you, God, and we give you honor. In your name, Jesus, I want to encourage you as we continue our time of submitting our hearts to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, continue with me as you grab your seats or if you are at home. Um, you can ha get comfortable in your couch or stand up if you're falling asleep. Um, but we have someone with us uh, this morning. You have heard last week that Grant Crawford, who leads One Life Church in Maritzburg, is with us. He's a dear friend to us and to our community. And I'm sure he is um, he's not a new face to a lot of you. Uh, but I want to encourage you to open your hearts. We are excited for this morning. We know as elders that uh, he has something that God has put on his heart for us. And we're really eager to hear it and to, to apply it to our hearts. Thank you. Well, good morning, Cornerstone Church. It's great to be with you. This is my very first time that I have gone to a church in person since lockdown. And so it's uh, with great excitement I'm with you today. I love Cornerstone Church. It is very similar to One Life Church in that it's pretty similar age. And uh, we also do church in multiple sites like you are doing. And in addition to that, we also you know, have some in-person meetings and, and some online like this. Although there's a little difference. Back where I come from, while I'm preaching like this at the live meeting, I'm looking at Zoom screens back home, and I see people, you know, having their breakfast and lying in bed. Bet you're glad I'm not looking at you right now. Uh, although I am seeing your elders. I'm sitting at the 7.30 meeting here with your, with your, your eldership team. It's up, up nice and early. And um, I suppose, like me, you might be a little uh, fed up with lockdown, aren't you? Uh, good announcement last night, though. I'm sure your elders will have something to say about that. The biggest lockdown has been the potential for us to isolate and become very private in our faith. And for, for the constraints to dumb us down and to make us think small. And, and for that reason, I want to speak to you today about your imagination. I believe God wants to fire up your imagination, to think the thoughts that are being thought in heaven, to, to recalibrate your idea of what the future could look like. You know, our imaginations are a um, precious, precious asset, and, and children are probably most in touch with their imaginations when compared to anyone else in the world. I, I've seen children play in a cardboard box like they were at Disneyland. I've seen them climb into a cardboard box and go to the moon in that box. And then a few hours later, in the same box, it's their cave that they're having a, a camp out in. Imagination. Children are amazing with their imagination. I can remember my uh, son, Keegan, when he was born, my wife was quite concerned that I was gonna buy him some guns. We'd had two little daughters before that, and I think it was because she had an older brother that, uh, you know, traumatized her a bit with the things that he shot. But I humored my wife, and I said, okay, I won't buy any guns for the boy. And so we bought him cricket bats and balls and rugby balls and motor cars. But one day, I came into the kids' playroom, and there was Keegan. He, he grabbed the Barbie doll of his sister. He pulled off the leg, he cocked it at the knee, and he went pop, 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 mowed down the teddy bears. That day, I realized we had lost our war with guns, but I also realized that the imagination of a child 
is, is so alive. And somehow when we get older, it gets dulled down, doesn't it? But those of us who manage to hang on to the ability to dream, to think, to imagine, will live extraordinary lives. Napoleon Bonaparte said this. He said, imagination rules the world. What did that little French emperor mean? Well, he meant those who dare to dream get ahead and live extraordinary lives. Let's look at some modern-day examples. Donald Trump, regardless of what you think of him, he is living an extraordinary life, isn't he? But he has imagined a wall, and he's imagined a great America behind the wall. And it's led to an extraordinary presidency, no matter your side of that political spectrum. What about Rusty Erasmus? Our rugby was in tatters, remember, a couple of years ago. But he imagined Sia Colisi holding a trophy up above the world. Those who imagine live extraordinary lives. Nelson Mandela, the best example in our country, stuck in a prison cell, didn't let it dull his imagination, his dream of a land that was free. Those who dare to let their imaginations go, will live extraordinary lives. Muhammad Ali, the famous boxer, says, if you have not got an imagination, you haven't got wings. And you, and you know what? He thought about wings, eh? Floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Einstein put it this way. He said, logic will get you from A to be, but imagination will take you anywhere. He said this, true genius is not one's IQ, but one's imagination. Blaise Pascal, the great French physicist, said this. He said, imagination decides everything. So what are these guys saying? They're saying that what goes on in your mind what goes on in your thoughts of the future, what goes on in your idea of what you could do is hugely determining of what your life's going to look like. we made to dream. We are best when we dream. I was on a ministry trip a couple of months ago down in Cape Town, and a young girl came out of the crowd and introduced herself to me. She said, my name is Knox. I used to come from Marisburg. In fact, I was in your church when I was at school there. I'm now at UCT. I said, oh, great, great to, great to see you. She says, um, yeah, I'm studying political science. I said, oh, political science. She must have seen the surprise on my face because that she leaned forward and she said, yes, I'm studying political science because I want to be the president of the Republic of South Africa. So I stood to attention and I said, yes, ma'am. What else could I say? But listen, even if she doesn't become the president of South Africa, she is going to do something great. Why? Because she can imagine herself in a future, in a space that very few other people can. Listen, an ordinary person with a dream will do far more than a gifted person without one. And so you might be saying, well, well Grant, it's easy for you to say, but my dreams have been squashed. People have trampled all over my dreams. People have told me I can't do it. And, and so I don't dream anymore. Listen, that, that's what the world does. I can remember my English teacher at school. I must have been about 16 years old. He said, Crawford, sit down, boy. I just tried to give an oral. He says, you are useless at orals and you've got a very soft voice. Well, well he was wrong about my voice. I just hadn't found it yet. I can remember once a man coming to me. We were in the middle of like a little bit of a revival in Maritzburg. He hated God. He hated the church. He sat down in front of me. He had just got out of his Lamborghini. And he said to me, I am extremely rich. I am extremely influential. And I am not going to rest until your church is no more. And I remember... In that moment, looking at these deathly eyes, thinking, what's going to happen to me? 
You see, the world wants to squash your dreams, wants to shut you down, put you in a box, lock you up. That, that guy, unfortunately, isn't alive anymore. But it's what the world does. I can remember my music teacher saying to me, Crawford, you can't sing, boy, sit down. Well, well, he was actually right on that one, so no, no point in dreaming there. But this is the problem with, with corona, is that corona and the, the associated lockdown that comes with it can lock down your dreams. And that's been like the urgency of my heart. Cornerstone Church has a foundation of reaching the nations. In your genetic has been wired by God, the raising up of leaders, the releasing of those leaders to the continents of the world. In you is a bigness, in you is a largeness, in you is a desire to see unchurched people come to church and God glorified in all that you do. And it would be an absolute tragedy if you sitting at home there lost something of the wonder of that. That somehow in our fragmentation and our uh, being locked away, the edge of the enormity of what God wants to do is, is dulled uh, for us. I was reading an article in the, by the World Economic Forum the other day, and it said this lockdown, because this is an international lockdown, it's not just a South African lockdown, is the largest psychological experiment ever conducted. And so I began to read it thinking, I wonder what they're talking about. Maybe they're talking about economic indicators. No, 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 they were talking about Depression, shrinkage, uh, intellectual decay. It was a, a fascinating article. And, and I feel that God wants to say to you today, He has designed you with an imagination. That's what Ephesians chapter 3 says. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. That's how Paul begins to talk to the Ephesians according to his power that is at work within us. And then he, he goes on to describe what God wants to do with them. God who is able to do immeasurably more than you imagine. Okay, so, so think of the most outrageous dream you've had. Think of the most outrageous thought you've had. God says, think again, boy, think again, my girl, and I'm going to top that. He says, I'll do immeasurably more, not just a little bit more, immeasurably more than that. I was with one of your businessmen this weekend, and I sat listening to him, listening to a dream that he had, a business dream, and I thought, whoa, it's a big dream. He's not just planning to do something, he's planning to do something downstream, upstream of that thing, that's going to create hundreds of jobs, that's going to... And as he was talking, I, th I thought to myself, I didn't say it to him to my shame, but I thought to myself, dream bigger, man. God is able to do immeasurably more than you dream or imagine. And you might say, well, Grant, really? Does God want to work there? Does God want to work on my thoughts? Does God want to work on my dreams? Yeah, even back in the Old Testament, in Proverbs 23, it says this, as a man thinks... So he is, or in the King James, as a man thinketh, so he is. So what's that verse saying? Well, as you think, your think, your, your thinks, <laughs> your thoughts, your thoughts activate your emotions, don't they? A and we often act on our emotion. So as a man thinks, so if he thinks, I can't, he, he's probably 100% correct. If he thinks I can, he's probably 100% correct. Because look, let's just say you wake up tomorrow and you think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really sad. I think this sucks. You will feel feelings of sadness and anxiety maybe and depression. And then, you, and then as a man thinketh, he is. You will sulk around the house. As a man thinks, so he is. I've heard people say, I can't, when they hear about something good happening to somebody else, I can't imagine anything like that would happen to me. Yeah, people have thought those thoughts through all of history. Job 3 says, says this, uh, the very thing that I feared came upon me. 
What's Joe saying? The thing that first appeared in my imagination, I thought those negative thoughts, and, and that became me as a man thinks. So he is. And, and so God wants to work on our imagination. He works there. He starts there. That businessman I was talking about, God's been busy with something in his mind, and it's going to result in all sorts of implications downstream. He also works on your imagination because it's got to do with your faith. You can't believe God without imagination. You can't have a faith without an imagination. You see, we can't see God. We, we, we can't touch him. And, and so there's, there's two ways of, of living. You can, you can live by faith or you can live by sight. If you just living by sight, you're going to miss faith. You're going to miss, you're going to miss God. Mark Twain, who, as far as I know, was not a believer, said this. He says, you can't depend on your eyesight if your imagination is out of focus. So, so put in Christian terms, what is he trying to say? Well, well Hebrews 11 puts it this way. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. So in other words, and he says this, and then it goes on to say this is what the ancients were commended for. So in other words, God, God says, you can't see me, but I want to put a hope and assurance, and God, God works on our inner man, and he presents himself there, and he helps our imagination. I helps our imagination with things like baptism. Why do you think he's given us baptism? Well, well, you can't see Jesus' death and resurrection, but, but as you see someone going down into the water, representing his burial, and then his resurrection again, it fires up your imagination. I see the tomb. I see the new life. Every time you break bread, and the blood is poured out, and the bread is broken, what's God doing? He's helping us. He's firing up our imagination because faith is being sure of what we cannot see. You see, you can, you can live by faith or you can insist on living by sight. Now, God says, I've given you this thing, imagination. He, he presents himself to you there in your, in your inner man. And, and when he gives us these glimpses of him, it's like a kid, you know, opening a wrapping, a Christmas wrap. You know what? The present inside. What do you think kids get most excited about? Is what they can see, yeah, they wrap it up, but, but their imagination is going, what could be inside there? What could be inside there? Oh, a little teddy bear. So what, what God does is that he, he gives us indicators to, to show us himself. And, and that, let me, let me explain it to you this way. One of the, the um, most famous people in that Hebrews 11 text, you know, because all those guys are commended for having seen something in the spirit and then walking in it. So some had dreams of their children being blessed and they, they walked in it. Some of them didn't even see it actually, physically, but they're all commended for having seen something. So seeing an inheritance or seeing children or, or seeing a job or, or seeing the presence of God. And, and God says, I, will, I commend you for that. Could be because they, they they saw it. They allowed God to get in there. Abraham was, was probably the most famous. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, now he was childless at this time. And God said to him, I am going to give you so many descendants. And Abraham, yeah, he was testing it. In fact, he oscillated from believing it, then not. Believing it, then not. And then in the midst of that, God says, I'm going to change your name. So I'm going to call you Abraham. Ham, which means father of many nations. So if you had bumped into Abraham shortly after his name was changed and said to him, oh, what's your name, sir? He would have said, Abraham. What does that mean? Father of many descendants. Well, well how many descendants do you have then? Well, actually none. None. And, and you can see Abraham in this crisis because he couldn't imagine it. So God took him outside one day and he said, okay, look up into the sky. Look up into the sky. You see the stars. What was God doing? He was firing up his imagination to believe that what God had said over him was true. And I believe that's what God's wanting to do over you today. 
That's to take you outside and say, listen, listen, much bigger, much more than you, you think it is. We're not born great. No one's born great. Not even Prince William's kids are born great. They might be born famous, but they're not born great. Rick Warren says it this way. He says, greatness comes when someone attaches themselves to a great dream. I believe God's wanting to put that dream in you and to captivate you with that dream. Churches become great when we allow God, God's dream for our future, to captivate us. So there you are sitting at home right now. I can't see you, but you're probably sipping your coffee. Hope you're out of bed. But, but I'm asking you to think about your church. Think about your home group. Imagine if when people came to home group, and hopefully the home groups are going to happen quite soon now, people got healed in those home groups. Someone walks in, he's just lost a job. That, that jobs are, are answers to prayers. That, that people develop friendships, lasting friendship for the rest of their lives. Imagine that. Imagine a place where kids are saying to their moms and dads, get out of bed, put that cappuccino away, let's get to church. There's only 50 people, let's get there. Imagine a church like that. You see, God wants to take our puny little thoughts. He wants to, uh, us to attach ourselves to his thoughts of our future. God's dreams are far, far greater than yours. Ephesians 3 goes on to say this. He who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably, not not just a little bit more, immeasurably more. But the most important reason, I think, why God wants to fire up your dreams today is that it honors God. It glorifies Him. When you do big things, it glorifies Him. This is my challenge to Cornerstone Church today. Ask God, I'm telling you those dreams are way bigger than you're thinking. These elders that are sitting here looking at me right now, way bigger than you're thinking. And it honors them. And you say, well, like some people might say, well, who do you guys think you are? That shouldn't be the question. It should be, who do you think God is? Remember Joseph, the dreamer, God gives him a dream. And he comes and he's saying to, he's a bit silly, you know, the way he spoke to his father and his brothers. But they were saying, shut up with your dreams. That's what people do to your dreams. Now, you should be saying, the the size of my dream is not dependent on the size of my ability. It depends on the size of my God who can do immeasurably more than you dream or imagine. He goes on to pray this prayer. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. He says, "I I want the eyes of your heart. Mark Twain's words, I want your, your heart in focus, focus with heaven, to dream the dreams I'm dreaming about you and your church and your faith and your family. And you might say, Grant, it's all well, you've rod us up saying dream big dreams, but how the heck do we do that? Because as I've said to you, people have stumbled all over my dreams. Well, firstly, I think we need to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. And so often we do it the other way around. We doubt our beliefs and believe our doubts. So in other words, how do we deal with our doubt? Because because doubt is the enemy of faith. Our doubt is the enemy of imagination. We've got to starve it. We've got to to kill those doubts. You know, there was this amazing case in, in Mark chapter nine, where this man with a sick child comes to Jesus and he says, you know, can you heal my my boy? And uh, Jesus says, you know, he looks, gives him attention and he says, because I know that you can do anything. And so Jesus says to him, you just need to believe. And so this is what he says. I think it's around about verse 14. He says, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. You say, Grant, how is that even possible? Believe, yet have unbelief. And it looks to me like in that story, Jesus says, well, that's enough. That's all I needed. I just need a little bit of belief. 
I just needed a mustard seed. I just needed a thought of belief. And boom, the miracle happens. We do it all the time. I think sometimes we think we've, we've got to wait until you know, we fasted and prayed for like 40 days and we're like in this super holy moment and my faith is really built up and boom, it's going to be like a magnet for heaven. No, no, he says, help me in my unbelief. You know, we, we live like that. Why can't we live like that spiritually? I mean, take, when I get into an airplane, and I know there's a pilot looking at me right now. When I get into an airplane, I must admit, I have my doubts about the pilots. I have my doubts about the technology. I have my doubts about the control tower. I look at the control tower and I think, Whew! all these planes coming and going. I have my doubts. But I grab hold of that seat and somehow I manage to enjoy the flight. I don't need to know everything. I've got my doubts, but I, I still believe. We're engaging in Wi-Fi. How many of you understand megabytes, gigabytes, upload, download, you know, USB cable? How many of you understand that stuff? It doesn't stop you enjoying the internet. And so in our faith, like that guy's father, he says, look, I believe, but it's like so much unbelief Help me there. Let me just hang on. And Jesus says, look, that's enough, man. That's enough. I just need a flicker of faith, a flicker of belief. He puts it in your mind. He, he fires up your imagination. You see, your imagination is essential for your faith. And, uh, and you've got to feed it. And you've got to kill the doubt and just latch onto that, that, that little bit of faith. So, so you might say, how do I feed, how do I feed my faith? I've, I'm building a house at the moment, and I've got this large embankment that I'm trying to grow grass on. Now, in, in summertime, every time I put topsoil on there, the rains would come and just wash the topsoil away, and no grass was growing. But it's taken perseverance. More topsoil, more runners, more sods. Nail it down in the ground. N now my, my lawn is looking uh, pretty dry, actually. It's wintertime, but it's looking more like a lawn because I've been feeding it. I've been nurturing it. Your faith needs to be fed. Fed times with the Holy Spirit, times with God, times in His Word. And then we've got to trade in our puny little dreams for God's big ones. Do you know that your mind can be occupied with nonsense? Your thought life can go negative, can go small, can go puny. This is what God says in Mark chapter 8. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it if a man gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? What's Jesus saying? He says, well, there's two ways to live. You can, by sight, focus on these puny little things or you can put that aside and say, God, I put to death that stuff. Fill my mind with the thoughts of heaven. Feed me with the whispers from the throne room. And as a man thinketh, so he is. I'm going to close with a thought from the Old Testament. It's this incredible picture Solomon paints in uh, Proverbs chapter 18. He says, The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Isn't that graphic imagery? It's like the name of the Lord is a fortified tower and, and the righteous run into the name of the Lord, into, into, into God's tower. The wealth of the rich is his fortified city. So he, 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 he contrasts two types of people. Those who are running and hiding in, a, in the name of God and those who have a fortified city of their wealth and their jobs and their sufficiency, the stuff that they see, that they can feel, that they can touch. They imagine it as a wall too high to scale. Isn't that amazing? Solomon says, these rich dudes... Imagine 
that all the stuff that is their fortified city is going to be security for them, but the righteous run into the name of the Lord. You can imagine that the stuff that you've been sowing into is going to protect you. Well, God says, let me flood your thoughts and imagination with something else. The name of the Lord, that's your tower. I'd like to pray for two groups of people here this morning as we close. The first are those who've, who've never, ever uh, understood what it means that God is your fortress, that the name of the Lord is a place that you can hide. This is what the Bible says. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're sitting watching here today, and God's been saying, yeah, the life you've been living is sub-zero. The life you've been living is not the life I've designed for you. You've been running to another fortified tower, the one that you can see, the one you've been hiding behind. He's saying, run to me now. Call on me. If you're ready to call on the name of the Lord, he says, I will reach down. I will reach down from heaven. I will transform you from the inside out. I will rescue. I'll save you from yourself and your puny little stuff. If you're ready to surrender today, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Let's pray. If you're ready to say, Lord God, I surrender to you. I want to call on you to be saved. I want you to flood my mind with your thoughts. I want you to transform me. And you pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I choose to walk out of my man-made constructs and I call on you to save me. I call on the name of the Lord that you be my strong tower, that you transform me, let you make me born again, let you make me a new creation. Call me out of this terrible place into your family, into your kingdom. I ask you to transform me now in the name of Jesus. Amen. And just before we close, I'd like to pray for the rest of you who have lived lives consecrated to the Lord, but somehow the thoughts of the world, the thoughts of their fortified towers have, have muddied your thinking. Maybe the dreams that you know God put there years ago have been trampled on and sort of maybe just through your neglect you haven't watered them. Maybe you've been feeding your doubts too much. Or maybe it's just people they've been saying to you, hey, God doesn't want to do that with your life. But you know, as I've been preaching this morning, you know, <laughs> even before the full lockdown's over, God's calling you out. And he's saying, listen, man, I've got a plan and a purpose for you. If that flicker of hope is in your heart right now, let me pray for you. I'm going to pray that God fans into flame those dreams, those thoughts, those purposes for you. Lord Jesus, of all the people in this precious church here at Cornerstone, I pray that you would reach into their homes right now, reach into their hearts right now. I pray, Lord God, that the dreams and the thoughts and the possibilities of heaven would overwhelm this leadership team, Lord, as the saints, as the people say, God, we want to live for you, wholeheartedly for you. And Father, where negativity and doubt and criticism, like Joseph experienced from his brothers, have been the echo in their ear, Lord, I pray that you would silence them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been really great being with you today. I trust that God has ministered to you. Uh, have a great day. Looking forward to coming back here and seeing you all in person. Cheers.